Hello world and welcome to this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Atmosera, and today we're going to be taking a look at the different APIs available in Cosmos DB. Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about the different APIs available in Cosmos DB. Now we're going to be looking at these from a high level, so we're going to be looking at them all together and talking about the pros and cons of each one. Then we're going to be doing more videos on these in the future. We're going to be looking at each one of the APIs in detail. We've already done one on table APIs where we talked about storage accounts. The same stuff there would apply to table APIs in Cosmos DB. So we'll do one on Cassandra, we'll do one on MongoDB, and then SQL API, and then lastly do one on the Graph API. But today we're just going to be kind of looking at these at the high level and talking about the pros and cons of each one and the use cases surrounding each one. So we've already looked at table APIs, but just to review kind of how this works is basically you have a key and that defines each row in the table. So in the case of table APIs, you have a partition key and a row key. And each one of these given rows in a table API has a set of keys associated with it. Now each row can have a separate set of keys. So this first record right here, this first row has two keys associated with it. And the second record only has two keys associated with it, but they're not the same as the first. It doesn't have key one. So this record uh, wouldn't have any value for key one and so on. So you see how that allows you to have different columns in each one of the rows in your table. So this doesn't enforce things like schemas. There's no enforcement of foreign keys or any of the other kind of constraints that you're gonna have whenever you start thinking about a table-oriented database. But this particular one isn't designed to be a relational database. It's basically just for storing data in a tabular format so that you can quickly access that data and also write to that data as well. So Cassandra is another table storage that is available in Cosmos DB. And like the table API, you, you have a key that identifies each row, and then you'll have uh, keys that are associated with each row in the, the table. And like the table API, there is no enforcement of a set of columns that have to be on every row. So a record can have a different set of rows than the next record in the table. So this one is basically the same as what we saw with the table API. The biggest difference between something like Cassandra and other databases is how it's stored on the storage media. So in a Cassandra type database, a column oriented database, data is stored according to the column rather than the row. So typically an RDBMS will store it a row at a time, and then each row would be contiguous in the database. With a columnar database or column-oriented database, it kind of turns that on its side, and then data is stored according to each row, and then it's retrieved according to each row. And that allows for better compression of data, and it also allows you to do other things with aggregations and operations like that that make operations very quick in this kind of data storage. However, it is not a replacement for RDBMSs because this is not going to lend itself well to relational databases, but it does allow you to do a lot of append operations very quickly. And it also allows you to have tight data storage and massively scalable data storage across multiple data disks that you have on a system. So there's a lot of different things that you can use this type of table storage for. One thing it's often used for is just object storage because you can quickly retrieve data out of a table-oriented database. So you can index the column, then go grab the data and then return it very quickly. And it's going to be able to retrieve and write data very quickly in that regard. So it's a great option just to store data if you don't plan on querying it or doing a lot of operations like this. This is really good for that kind of operation. Another thing it's good for is data aggregation. And so you'll see this often used in OLAP systems. So that's online analytics processing versus OLTP, which is online transaction processing, which is typically what you're gonna find in something like a relational database. But OLAP systems will often incorporate Cassandra or something similar to Cassandra in those systems so that you can do data aggregations such as summing up data or creating aggregates of averages or counts and different things like that that is common in data aggregation. 
Again, compression is another one that's we mentioned already because column uh, store databases allows you to compress the data in columns so you don't have a lot of air in the records. So that allows you to have tighter data storage. And it's good for write heavy operations because typically these kinds of databases only allow for append operations. So everything is indomitable so that you can get a lot of append operations without having to do updates on data. So this allows for a lot of data to be written to the tables and allows you to scale these things widely as well as vertically so that you can have a lot of data writes going on in parallel. The one thing that this doesn't do is replace an OLTP. So a lot of folks think of this, they see tables and they automatically go to an OLTP or our remote database management system, something like SQL Server. It's not a replacement for that because there's no relationships that are enforced by table APIs or Cassandra. There's no foreign key relationships that you're trying to build into these databases and these database tables. In fact, that's really not even a, a good use case for these, or even if you try to mock it. So the encouragement here is to use table storage more for denormalized data, for append only operations, for object storage, for aggregation, but don't try to make it a replacement for a remote database management system where you have foreign key constraints, where you're doing a lot of data queries across those relationships and you're doing a lot of complex joins and things like that. This is not going to perform well for that. It's not intended for that. Perhaps what Cosmos DB is best known for is its SQL API and Cosmos DB implements a document database that allows you to store documents in the database, then use SQL to basically read the data from that database for querying it and then doing other types of aggregations and things like that. It also has a protocol level implementation of MongoDB, so you can almost use this as a drop and replacement for Mongo, although it doesn't always work because it doesn't implement everything that Mongo does. However, if you can use it for that purpose, basically you get MongoDB in Azure without having to spin up any kind of virtual machines as a service. Regardless of which one of these APIs you use, you still have a SQLite syntax for reading data out of the documents. And it's gonna store data in a hierarchical fashion like we see here. So a document in this context would be something like XML or JSON. Typically these are using you know, a JSON format, but you could easily transform something like an XML document into a JSON document and then store it inside of the SQL API or in Mongo. And then you can store arbitrarily hier arbitrary hierarchies in the data. So you have something like a high level key that identifies a given document. And then you can have sub keys under that with different values. And then that can then be arbitrarily deep depending on how many levels you want to go down inside of your document. And there's no enforcement of schemas or anything like this. So it's very flexible in what you can store in this. So it gives you a a lot of options for that kind of data storage. One thing that this is great for is for flexible data structures because this doesn't enforce schemas. This allows you to add new fields as they arise or if you need to add new levels of, of data a complexity, you can easily implement this because there's nothing that's going to enforce a strict schema like you'd get from an RDBMS. And also all of the complexity of the relationships are embedded in the documents themselves. And so this makes a very nice system for arbitrary hierarchies in data structures that you might not be able to get in something like an RDBMS, or if you did implement it in RDBMS, it'd be very difficult to do. So this also lends itself to read heavy workloads where you have complex queries, because all of the complexity is basically in the documents themselves, all of the relationships between various kinds of things that you're gonna be storing in documents is embedded in the documents. You have a single API that you can query those documents from and return data back to the client and traverse those hierarchies without having to do a bunch of complex joins like you would do in something like SQL Server or Oracle or, or a table oriented storage system like that. But this is not very useful for read heavy, uh, write heavy operations because this basically entails that you're not you're going to be doing basically entire document updates whenever you go to update documents. You can do partials in these APIs, but it's generally not considered something that you want to do a lot of because it ends up making the data distributed across a data system and it's kind of fragmented across that data system as well. So it can make the data incredibly hard to maintain and actually slow down your performance if you have to do a lot of write heavy operations. Usually it's not a big deal if you're adding data, but if you have to do a lot of updates, 
it can be penalizing if you have to do a lot of writes on the database. So if you need a write heavy uh, data system, maybe consider something like the table APIs such as Cassandra or table API in Cosmos DB. If you need a lot of uh, write heavy operate, read heavy operations, use SQL API or the Mongo API. So the Graph API is a fairly new concept in databases that most people aren't going to be familiar with, but it's pretty straightforward when you think uh, about the nature of the way it's designed. It's basically where you have nodes, which are represented by these circles right here. And these are basically objects that have a, a list of key value pairs on them. And each node is connected by way of an edge, which is basically represented by this line right here. And a node can be connected to any other node, and, and that edge basically defines the relationship between the different kinds of nodes. So this allows you to have any kind of arbitrary relationship between any of the nodes. This can represent something like airports, uh, where you have each node representing an airport, and each one of these edges represents a path between different airports or a flight path between each of those airports. You can use it to represent routes, or maybe you can use it to represent something like a network that is in a building. So each one of these are a network device, and the connection is defined by the edge right here. Or it can be a social network, where each one of these are an entity in the social network, such as a person or a place or something like that. And this is, the, and the edge defines the relationship between the persons, maybe they're friends, or maybe they're visiting an event at a particular uh, node or something like that. The point of the graph API is to allow you to have an object represented by a node and then have it relate to any other object by way of an edge. And that relationship can be any number of things. And there's no enforcement of what objects can relate to other objects. The one thing that graph databases are really good at is, is building out complex relationships between the nodes that are stored in the graph databases. So with hierarchical databases like uh, the table API and Mongo, it's fairly fixed and that which is stored inside of the document is how it's going to be related hierarchically. And you can query across those naturally, but this allows you to have entities that are arbitrarily related to any other entities. And so you can query across those data nodes. Uh, pretty much arbitrarily. And so you can start with one and then traverse uh, different n edges to other nodes to bring back data, depending on how you want to query it. So this is a very useful for representing things like state and relationships between a lot of different arbitrary objects. What it's not good at is transactional data. So you wouldn't want to use this for storing payment data or anything that's going to be appending a lot of data to a data storage mechanism. This is really not good for that. So this is not going to be something that you would use for payment processing or logging or anything like that. You would probably want to use something like a table storage for that kind of uh, relationship. And this is really going to be useful for storing state information that you want to know about relationships to other things. The main drawback of this from a technical perspective is it's just not as popular as other kinds of databases. And so the documentation and the examples and the tutorials on all this are kind of sparse, especially around the graph database in Cosmos DB. It uses Neo4j's implementation of Gremlin, which is basically a queryable API that's a little bit idiosyncratic once you get your head around it, though. It's not too bad, but it can be a lot of fun to play with. And it's really cool once you kind of get your head around really what is going on in a graph database. And it really does lend itself to storing data and understanding the relationship relationships between all that data, particularly around static state and things like that. If you like this content, please consider checking us out online at www.windelect.com where you can find several blog entries about topics related to Microsoft Azure and software development. And you can also subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button below and then clicking on the bell icon to receive notifications when new content becomes available. Until next time, thanks.